Hi, my name is Alex Purnomo. I'm the pastor of Doonside Anglican Church. This is the seventh video in the series on the book of Revelation. I would like to take us through chapters 15 to 18 of Revelation in this video and invite you to reflect on the good news of God's judgment. We Christians know God's amazing grace and God's love in saving us from His judgment through faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In Christ, there is no condemnation. That's the greatest news of all. But we must also understand something of what God's judgment is like. The more we understand about God's judgment, the more we understand His love and His grace in saving us from that judgment. The more we know about what God saves us from, the more we would appreciate how much He loves us in Jesus Christ. We've seen a fair bit of God's judgment on his enemies already in Revelation. But in chapter 15, we are introduced to God's final judgments. An apocalyptic scene with seven angels with the seven last plagues of God. We read in verse 1 that with these plagues, God's wrath is completed. But in the next verse, we also see the people of God who are said here to be those who had been victorious over Satan and his agents. In Revelation, to be victorious means to persevere and remain loyal to Jesus, regardless of the pain or cost. Look at what the people of God were doing in this scene. They sang a song. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Please note the song's lyrics. How do you think God's people were feeling when they sang this song? They describe God's judgment as great and marvelous, just and true, holy and righteous. The song's lyrics express their joy and praise to God for revealing His wrath and judgments against His enemies. Thus, God's judgment is actually a good news. God's people understand that God sends his judgment not because he is bad-tempered or he lost control. No, he judges because he is great and marvelous, just and true, holy and righteous. God cares for the world too much to let it be corrupted by sin and evil. He promised forgiveness to all who repent and trust in the Lamb, in Jesus. But he will judge those who reject the Lamb and follow Satan instead. In chapter 16, the seven bowls of God's judgments are poured out into the world. Many of these judgments partly remind us of some of the plagues that God sent upon Egypt in the days of Moses. You know, the sores, the river of blood, the darkness, the frogs, and the hailstorm. The difference is that this time, these plagues are on a global scale. Moreover, they are far more destructive, even more destructive than the previous judgments in chapter 9. This time, what is affected or destroyed is not just a third of this or a third of that. Rather, we're talking about 100%, a total destruction. In the middle of this series of judgments, in verse 5 to 7, we hear again the affirmation that God's judgment fits the crime. People receive what they deserve. This is a great comfort when we experience injustice, even grave injustice, whether it's committed by other individuals, or groups, or even by our own government. This is a strong reason to refrain from violent revenge, from taking justice into our hands. Because there is a God, and He is great and marvelous, just and true, holy and righteous. This God will right every wrong. Justice will be done for every sin committed against us. What about those who suffer all these judgments of God? How do they respond? Sadly, they do not repent. It's not just that they refuse to repent. They even cursed God in verses 9, 11, and 21. Actually, the word translated cursed in these verses is the word translated blaspheme in chapter 13, which we looked at in the last video. Blaspheming means to misrepresent God and His character in any way, and it's what the beast out of the sea would do. Sadly, these people in chapter 16 have become like the beast that they worshipped. In verse 13, we see 
Behind all these opposition to God, the same demonic spirits that we already met in the last video, when we looked at chapter 13, namely the dragon, which refers to Satan, and the two beasts that serve him. But for the first time in this book, the second beast is revealed as the false prophet. Remember that the second beast is the one that comes out of the land, the one with the power to deceive, using lies and signs. That's exactly what the false prophet does. These demonic spirits gather the kings of the whole world together in verse 14 for the battle on the great day of God Almighty to this place called Armageddon. Verse 16 is the only time the word Armageddon appears in the Bible. It means the mountain of Megiddo. But actually, there was never any mountain of Megiddo. That's one of the reasons why I believe this is another apocalyptic imagery that cannot be taken literally. There is a place called Megiddo that was about two days' walk from Jerusalem. It became proverbial in Judaism as the place where the people of God were attacked by God's enemies. Judges 5 talks about how in Megiddo, God's people defeated enemies who oppressed God's people, enemies with overwhelmingly greater power. Megiddo is also the location of the death of King Josiah, one of the greatest kings of Judah. When the Jews heard the word Megiddo, it's a bit like when Christians hear the word Calvary. Zechariah 12 prophesied an end-time attack by ungodly nations against God, in which the ungodly nations are destroyed. At the same time, God's people receive the spirit of grace as they look on the one whom they have pierced and mourn for him like the mourning in Megiddo. There you find the word Megiddo being mentioned. The phrase, the one whom they have pierced, clearly refers to Jesus Christ. So it's important to note in Zechariah's prophecy that somehow the destruction of ungodly nations is directly connected to Jesus' death and Megiddo. There are all these mixed metaphors with the word Armageddon or the Mount of Megiddo. Thus, in short, I believe this reference to Armageddon in verse 16 is an apocalyptic imagery that refers to the defeat of all God's enemies and the destruction of all false prophets through Jesus Christ. And Jesus says in verse 15, Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Jesus said similar things, for example, in Matthew 24. We are told to be ready for Jesus to return, as he promised. To remain clothed in the Bible means to be clothed with Christ. Before God's justice, we are all sinners, we are all naked and exposed. But God himself clothes those who trust in Christ. What a wonderful reminder that Despite Armageddon, we are blessed because we are in Christ. In chapter 17, we see the punishment of the so-called great prostitute, a symbol of spiritual adultery, a familiar imagery in the Bible of unfaithfulness to God. The great prostitute sits by many waters. In verse 15, we are told that the many waters represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. They are all under the power of the same sin of spiritual adultery. In verse 3, the woman is said to be sitting on a beast, which we saw already in chapter 13 in the last video. The beast out of the sea, one of the agents of Satan. In verse 5, the woman is said to have written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, and so on. Now, the Babylonian Empire had long gone. So this is again another apocalyptic symbol it stands for the world that lives in ignorance of God or in opposition to God. A world that captures and oppresses God's people. In verse 6, we are told that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people. The blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. But in verse 16, we find that Satan and his agents will hate the prostitute and turn against her. She is burnt, shamed, and destroyed by Satan himself. Now that's interesting, isn't it? What the text here is really saying is that these terrible kingdoms of the world ultimately will destroy themselves. In verse 17, we are told that the kings of this world support the beast's regime by handing over their authority to Satan. 
But that doesn't last. It lasts only until the words of God are fulfilled. Isn't that a great comfort? That means that even as the kings of this world rebel against God and support the beast, they ironically carry out God's sovereign purpose. It says here that God has put it in their hearts to accomplish His purpose. Even when the whole world opposes God and a lot of God's people suffer as a result, God is in control of what's going on. Satan has no chance against God. At the end of the day, God can control even the evil minds of Satan and the rulers of this world and use their evil for their own self-destruction. Until God's appointed time is at hand for Jesus to return and bring about God's kingdom in all its fullness. In verse 14 we read that they will wage war against the Lamb, but we are assured that the Lamb will triumph over them, because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. This is a great encouragement for us, the people of God, to trust in God, to entrust our whole lives to Him, and to endure. The end is coming, and that's good news. Chapter 18 is a kind of lament about the fall of Babylon. But it's not the kind of lament that says, Oh, I'm so sorry that's happening. What a tragedy. No, rather, it's a lament that says, Oh, this is desperately sad, but she's getting what she deserves. It also includes a warning to escape from Babylon. Verse 4 says, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues. What does that command mean? It surely is not a command for us to leave all civilization, go off the grid on a remote island, for example. It's also not about a pure church or a pure church denomination. Remember the Lord Jesus prayed to God the Father in John chapter 17. Not that He takes us out of the world, but that He protects us from the evil one. So we are in the world, but not of the world. Jesus sent us into the world to be a witness for Him. We need to keep that in mind when we try to understand this command in verse 4, to come out of Babylon. The command is not that we separate ourselves physically from the world, but that we, as God's people, do not participate in the sins of this world. If that cost us our popularity, or our job, or even persecution and death, so be it. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. In verse 20, we are again encouraged to rejoice for the coming judgment of God upon the sinful world. God's judgment is great and marvelous, just and true, holy and righteous. God's judgment is really good news. But why doesn't God immediately send judgment as soon as someone does something wrong or commits a sin? The answer is that God is giving people time to turn from their sins. God's judgment is delayed. So what do we then do? We make judgments because God seems not to. We long for justice to be done. And when we don't see it, we create our own justice. But the message of chapters 15 to 18 of Revelation is that God's judgment is coming. It's good news. If the sinner or the perpetrator repents and trusts in Jesus, then justice will have been done at the cross. The punishment for the sin they have committed against us would have fallen on Jesus. But if the sinner or perpetrator does not repent and trust in Jesus, then justice will be done at the last day. God will establish justice and avenge His people. He wants us to trust Him, to be ready for Jesus' return, to not be deceived, and to endure even in the face of injustice and persecution. John's vision doesn't stop there. We will continue with chapters 19 to 20 in the next video, which is the climax of Revelation with God's victories over His enemies. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like button or the subscribe button and share it with other people so that they too might benefit from it. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.